What's going on, Imperials? It's Emperor Cubone here. The Sinnoh region, to me, feels like a second home. It was the first Pokémon game that I got to own and play in its entirety. I have so many wonderful memories of this region and could list compliments all day long. But even with the rose-red tinted glasses on, I can still tell that there are some problems with the region. So, here are my top six Pokémon problems with the Sinnoh region. Number 6. Cutoffs. Every game has roadblocks at certain points to keep you from going too far before you're ready. This usually results in cut trees or smashable rocks in your path that can be overcome with the next gym badge. But by the fourth generation, the developers must have been sitting in their boardroom thinking that that was getting tired and wanted to spice things up. Unfortunately, I think I would have rather had the traditional obstacles because then at least I would have known what to do. It starts off pretty well with Jubilife having a surf spot and a rocky cave preventing you from going too far. But once you get to Orberg, there's a tiny stupid ramp that you can't use. Even if you try and get more speed, you just slide back down. In successive towns, there are a number of people who simply refuse to let you pass until you complete some arbitrary task. One of the worst happens above Salacian Town where there's a herd of Psyduck standing in your path, too confused to move. What is this? What are you supposed to do? Can you battle them? Not only is this roadblock strange, but also bewildering. Having never encountered this sort of thing, I have no idea how I'm supposed to get around it. It's not until about two gym badges and a lake trip later does the champion of the region have to intervene and give you an otherwise useless item to disperse the annoying pack of psychic ducks. And then there's Sunny Shore. There's one guy that stops you from going because of a power outage. I would check back after every single story point was completed to see if I was now deemed worthy of passage, but it was all for naught. I even tried looking for a spare part for the power plant or something like you do in Kanto. Only once I had climbed to the top of the highest mountain in the region and fought the embodiment of time itself was I able to visit the dumb tourist trap. And when I got there, I saw that they had solar panels for roads! How do you have a power outage when you walk on a giant generator? What, was it too cloudy and sunny shore? These ill-defined, arbitrary cutoff points make it far too confusing and infuriating to try and navigate the Sinnoh region properly, especially for first-timers. Number 5. A Lackluster Cast The people that make up a new region are just as important as the Pokémon that live there. The characters that people will latch onto can never truly be predicted. Some of this is due to our projecting onto the characters what we want to see, and other times we allow extra sources to influence our perception like the anime. And Sinnoh has produced some great characters. Cynthia is hands down the best champion we have ever had. And I love the Sinnoh region. It was the first I ever got to properly play. But when I'm brutally honest with myself, I can admit that the people that inhabit this land are not all that interesting. I respect the crap out of my elderly professor, but his standoffish nature keeps me from becoming too emotionally attached. <laughs> and the gym leaders? The father-son duo are so blandly interchangeable that I have trouble keeping their names straight. Volkner clearly doesn't even want to be there. And even the foreign beauty queen makes you do math. These two are pretty okay, but being cute does not a personality make. Alright, let's think. Who else even is there? Oh yeah, this chick that I constantly forget about. What's her name? Mrs. Maisel? The only one with real personality is Crasher Wake. And don't even get me started on the Elite Four, I couldn't remember half of their faces. And the evil team is no real prize either. Cyrus is a super evil guy, but his motivations are not entirely clear as to why he hates emotion so much. And the admins? The only reason I remember them are the outfits, and the only reason I know their names are Jupiter and Mars is because those were my favorite Sailor Moon characters. To be very clear, and I know I'll get accusations for this anyway, but I do not HATE anyone in the cast. Well, except maybe for Maybelline over here. 
It's just that looking back through, the majority of my best memories don't come from the characters in these games like some other versions. And in a region with quite a few things to enjoy, that starts to stand out. Number 4. Legendary Spots Sinnoh got a little overzealous with the legendaries. In fact, a substantial percentage of the Sinnoh decks is made up of legendary Pokémon. But with the addition of Wi-Fi, they also went a little extra crazy with events released for the games. Many of these were special distributions of certain legendaries and mythical Pokémon, meaning it would be impossible to get them from any other means in the main story of the games. For several of the legendaries, the way you encounter them is by going to far-off, secluded locations. This is true for event Pokémon and otherwise. One, it's a lot of work. Especially places like Turnback Cave, where you can get there okay, but once you're inside, it's completely up to chance whether you'll find him through the next door. Second, these spots are in the games. It's not an update, or a patch, or an addition to the games. It's just downloading a key to open a door that's always been there. These locations, mostly being islands of some sort, have always been there, but the game doesn't allow you to go unless you get the proper clearance. New Moon Island has the same boat captain that gave you a ride earlier, so why can he not take me there to begin with? If I want to go out of my way to find an empty field, that should be my choice. This would be like if half of the Mirage spots in Oros could only be accessed through some DLC. Worst of all, they had one of these events planned and coded in to encounter Arceus, but they never released it. That means that without cheating, no one has ever been able to play the complete Sinnoh experience. I mean, the only way to fix it would be to redo it. Sinnoh Remakes confirmed? Number 3. Route 217 The blizzards in Sinnoh are ridiculous. This is not about the move blizzard, nor is it even about hail. That's fine. After you come out of Mount Coronet, you enter a snowy area, which is pretty cool, since that was the first time that we had ever seen snow in a Pokémon game. Then you go a little further and the snow picks up so much that you can barely see anything that's happening, and your movements might as well be through syrup, because even running is slowed to a crawl. Again, I know that they were new to the whole Tundra aesthetic, but who thought it would be fun to have all motions and vision impeded so heavily? Why would we want to play through a sluggish, monochromatic version of the game? This isn't Gen 1! I'm convinced that there are still probably some items left to get or trainers to battle on my Diamond version, which has the most consecutive time logged on any Pokémon game I've ever owned, just because it is such a tedious chore to get through that section of the map. Standard hail is fine, but this eternally crippling arctic storm makes the north part of Sinnoh painful to play through. No other weather conditions have ever been so debilitating that they hinder basic gameplay. Well, almost no other. Number 2. An utter lack of diversity. The key to a solid Pokémon team is diversification. You'll run across a variety of mons on your journey, so it's a good idea to spread out your investments to better deal with as many threats as possible. This can be especially difficult in the beginning stages of the game, but it usually gets better as time goes on. Usually. In Sinnoh, for whatever reason, there are a number of types that are noticeably underrepresented. The most obvious standout would be the fire type. There were precious few new fire types added in Gen 4, but that's not even the worst of it. If you did not pick up a Chimchar, you had no other choice than a Ponyta if you wanted a fire type on your team. This is most glaring in the Elite Four, when Flint is supposed to be a fire type trainer, but the majority of his team has nothing to do with it. The same holds true for Volkner. This electric type gym leader only had two electric types, which incidentally are the only two available for the player as well. If for some reason you didn't like Luxray, you had the choice of Raichu, or wait until the end of the game for Rotom. And without the Grass-type starter, you have two choices, but really only one choice that's any good. 
The few remaining grass types in the decks are either crazy rare or too late in the game to matter. Did you know that Wormadam didn't even originally change types? I didn't. They did address this later in Platinum and broaden the region's decks a bit, but that's too little too late. So odds are that your Sinnoh Hall of Fame looks eerily similar to a lot of other people's. Number 1. A Terrible Ecosystem South of Mount Coronet and Sinnoh is largely composed of wetlands. This was interesting since we had not quite seen that before in any previous region. When traversing the new terrain, the player would sink into the mud and encounter wild Pokémon like in regular grass. However, every so often the player would sink even further and get stuck. At first, I thought my game had broken. But once I jiggled the controls a bit, I was able to hop free. Once it happened a second time, I realized that it was not a glitch, but was in fact someone's intention to make the swamps more tedious than necessary. Who looks at a game and says, you know what's fun? Getting stuck! Even with repels, it takes forever to get through these routes simply because you have to keep falling in. It's bad enough that part of the map is covered in these mires, but the safari zone in Sinnoh is called the Great Marsh. Yippee! I think they forgot that this was supposed to be a game designed to be enjoyable. And the worst part is that neither the safari zone nor the surrounding bog areas house a significant amount of unique Pokémon to make it worth your time. With only a few exceptions, these Pokémon can be found in far more traveler-friendly areas that don't require either paid entry or a litany of HMs to get through. But that's not even the worst of it. Then we have Fog. This is by far the worst, most useless weather condition ever created. Fog was an exclusive to the fourth generation because the minute they saw how horrible it was in the games, they never tried it again. The only purpose that Fog has is to hide things slightly out of frame in the overworld and to make Pokémon moves miss in battle. That's it. No types or moves get any sort of buff from it. All it does is drag out battles far past the point of being fun because you just can't hit a stupid knockdown. They invented a whole HM just for this feature, but unlike others like Surf or Rock Smash that are actual moves, Defog does no damage whatsoever. That means you either have to lump someone with a useless move for the majority of the game, or suffer through the rage-inducing inaccuracies of the fog. For me, it was mostly the latter. My Staraptor with Aerial Ace quickly became my very good friend when approaching the fog. Needless to say, everyone hated this feature and they promptly removed it from any other games. Meaning if they didn't make Defog do something else, it would literally be a useless move. So at least it gets rid of hazards now, but that's annoying on its own. I don't know how this place has more problems with the weather than the region with the constantly battling weather trio, but somehow they do. Fog doesn't make you a better trainer in any way. It doesn't make you think outside the box, it doesn't increase your bond with your Pokémon. All it does is decide to create massive annoyances in random spots in the story. Unsurprisingly, these types of environments have never returned in any successive Pokémon games, and I cringe to think of how they might handle it in the inevitable remakes. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if Fog is a reason that some people put down these games and never picked them back up. And if anything can make someone stop playing altogether, it is a major problem. So, those are my top 6 Pokémon problems with the Sinnoh region. What problems do you have with Sinnoh? Let me know down in the comments. Also be sure to leave a like, share this video, and subscribe so that you too can become an Imperial today. And we'll see you around next time!